Welcome to Advanced Data Analysis 1 with me, Eric Earhart, Professor of Statistics at the University of New Mexico. In this video, we'll be looking at Part 2 of Getting Started with R, where we will be looking at plotting using the Grammar of Graphics package, ggplot2, written by Hadley Wickham. So here we are at the course website. We are scrolling down way too far <laughs> into the list, and here we are at Class 5 for R programming. So this is still under Chapter 0, and recall the R link here, if I open that in a new tab by pressing Control Enter, will bring us to all the code that we'll be using in this chapter. It starts right about there. Okay, so you will only need to install the Grammar Graphics package once by doing install.packages ggplot2 inside of quotes. Once it's installed on your computer, then you are ready to use it. And you need to tell R that you want to access the functions in the library by re asking library ggplot, and then the functions will be available, as well as any data sets in that package. So I'm going to go over to the notes. Uh, this is the chapter 0 notes for ggplot, and I'm going to scroll on down to plotting with ggplot. And I'm going to do most of this lecture right from the notes, but I do strongly recommend working from the R code and running these commands in your computer and seeing what the results are and making changes and experimenting. So, there are lots of ways to produce graphics in R. In my opinion, R is one of the uh, better packages for producing plots of data and data summaries. There are plenty of functions within the base graphics package, such as uh, plots, points, and lots of ways to manipulate the graphics parameters, PAR. Um, there's another package called Lattice, which is very fast and produces uh, nice plots. Uh, I think I think this is a very really nice package to use. Grammar of graphics tends to take slightly longer to render graphics when you're only producing you know one to ten plots. It's it's not something you're going to notice. If you need to produce hundreds of plots fast in a high production environment, you may want to consider Lattice. But in my opinion, ggplot, um, the implementation of um, Wilkinson's grammar of graphics is uh, is pr produces probably some of the best plots you'll see um, directly from a package, uh, you, and you can always read these into uh, a vector formatting uh, graphic software such as Adobe Illustrator if you want to manipulate the plots uh, further from there. You know, not moving the points around or anything, but changing you know title fonts and things like that. All right. So, a prerequisite for using ggplot is that our data is in a data frame. We're going to be talking a lot about this uh, in another lecture, but data frame is an object that's basically a rectangular data set. Each row represents an observation, and each column uh, can have a different data type and we're about to look at a data set now that is like that. So the there is a data set called MPG within the uh, ggplot library. So let's start off by loading ggplot. That gives us access to the data set MPG. And if we ask for help on MPG, oops, looks like I'm going to have to run RStudio after all. So we'll start our studio here. I'm going to clear the console with Control L, and I'm going to show you what happens when you load a package. So here's my package list. I've got lots of packages in here, probably too many. Here is my ggplot2 package there in the bottom right. And there's two ways to make that package available uh, to use the functions inside it. One is to click this box, but we're not a fan of clicking in this class because it's not repeatable. So I'm going to instead 
do library ggplot2. And when I press enter, that put that check mark in that box for me. So now all the uh, functions in ggplot are available to me. And data sets. So if I do question mark mpg for the miles per gallon data set and make the help window large enough to read, fuel economy data from 1999 to 2008 for 38 popular models of car. And it describes uh, what the details are of this data set. There's a manufacturer, model, engine displacement, year, number of cylinders, transmission type, the drive type, whether it's front wheel, rear wheel, or four wheel drive, the city miles per gallon, the highway miles per gallon, and then two mystery var variables. We may never know what those are. And so if I just type MPG at the prompt, and give myself some space in the console and press enter, I've got 234 observations and all of those variables. If I go up to the top, that's where it begins. Okay, the first record in this data set is an Audi manufacturer, model A4, a 1.8 liter displacement made in 1999, four cylinders, an automatic transmission with something in parentheses which I don't know what it is. It's a front-wheel drive car. It gets 18 miles per gallon in the city, 29 on the highway, and then P and compact. Okay, I guess I know what class is. Just don't know what FL is. It's a P. Alright, so let's go back over to um, the lecture notes. There's lots of ways of looking at data sets. Um, we can look at the tops and bottoms of data sets with um, head. Head will, by default, give us the first six observations. If we wanted the first ten observations, we can put a comma and put the argument ten in there. And there's the first ten observations. Tail, MPG. Three will give us the last three observations. All right. Uh, we can also look at the structure of a data set, and I use structure all the time. Every time I get a new object, I often look at the structure just to verify what I have there. So this tells me that the structure of MPG is a data frame. Okay, that's a particular data type. It's rectangular, has rows and columns. It's, this says that it has 234 rows, which it calls observations, with 11 variables, and each variable is in a column. The, it gives the name of each variable after a dollar sign, and I'm going to show you what that dollar sign does in a second. And so the variable manufacturer is a factor variable. That means it's categorical. It has 15 levels, and it's going to start listing alphabetically or whatever the order is of those labels um, of those 15 levels. So the first level is Audi, the second level is Chevrolet, and dot dot, there's more levels to come. And then the ones here indicate that the first several um, were Audi, meaning that uh, this label one is associated with Audi, the first level of that factor variable there will be numbers 1 up to 15 because there are 15 levels. For the model, for example, uh, this is also a factor variable with 38 levels. There's a forerunner, there's a four-wheel drive, okay? And the first oh, seven of those were a forerunner, and then the next three were four-wheel drive. All right, uh, we have some numerical va variables. We have some variables that take integers, and we see what the first the first several values are of the 234 observations. Uh, you can get at individual variables by doing MPG, and there's lots of ways to do this. This lecture is not on this topic, but if we do, for example, uh, let's, uh, how about a small how about year? So MPD, MPG dollar sign year will return just the year vector. So if I press enter here, I will get all those years. 
All right, back to the notes. That's what that's what a lot of this stuff says. Okay, uh, summary. We'll summarize uh, a tautology for me. It is uh, it will give us um, a different uh, numerical summary depending on what the data type is. So, for example, manufacturer. There were fifteen of those, and it's going to because they're categorical. It will give us a frequency. So, thirty-seven of these were Dodge. 34 were Toyota, and so on. And notice it gives them in the descending order of the number or the frequency of that category. So 37 is the maximum, then 34, then 27, and so on. And it's not going to summarize all of them here. Instead, it's going to stop at the seventh one and say other, and all the other categories account for 74 of the 230, no, 432 observations. Nope, I don't think I have that number correct. 234. Okay. Uh, model was categorical. Displacement was continuous, where it was a numerical variable. So it gives the five number summary the minimum, first quartile, median, third quartile, and maximum, as well as the mean. And the purpose of including the mean and the median together is if these two numbers are fairly close to each other relative to the range of the rest of the data that suggests the data is symmetric. Otherwise, if the mean is, say, much greater than the median, indicates a right skewness of the data. Okay, so that's a summary. Finally, we're going to uh, start plotting. So let's scroll down and look at a plot first, and we'll come back and see the code that produced it. So what do we have? So the way to read a plot is first to read the axes. So we've got the displacement on the x-axis, and we have highway miles per gallon on the y-axis. That is, those two variables were encoded to distance along or position along an axis. The uh, lower bound here is about 1.5, and it goes up to 7 for displacement, and highway miles goes from just over 10 up to about 45. And a pattern we see is um, as the engine displacement, the engine displacement is small, so if, if we have small engines, we tend to get large highway miles per gallon. And as your engines get larger, you get worse, worse miles per gallon. Okay. So let's go look at the code that created that plot. Holy moly, just three lines. And in fact, it's, it's pretty easy to put this on uh, two lines. But I tend to think of the grammar of graphics as producing layers of information. So I'm going to show you uh, that paradigm, and you're welcome to uh, conform to that or break and do your own thing if you like. Um, so the first thing we do is use the command ggplot and specify the data set. So we've got a, um, our data frame, which is a, the miles per gallon data frame, and we, we're going to start by assigning aesthetics. Now, aesthetics is a word that, for me, means encode. So we are going to take uh, the values in the displacement, and we're going to, going to encode those as a position along the x-axis. We're going to take the values in the highway miles per gallon and encode that as position along the y-axis. And that plot is going to, or the, at least that uh, initialization of our plot is going to go into an object called P. Now you can make this longer, a longer name. I use, tend to use P and P1 and P2 and P3, things like that. Um, and we'll see examples of that later um, because I tend to add lots of layers. Okay. Now I haven't told it what we're going to plot. I haven't as assigned any geometric object um, to our plot. So our first layer in this plot is going to be assigned geometric objects points. Okay, we're going to put some points on there. So this effectively sets up the axes, the x and y axes, and the second line adds the geometric objects of points on. And geom is, is sort of a short shorthand for geometric object.
and what type of object? It's a point. And we're going to see a bunch of types of objects as we go through this. Finally, I'm going to print that plot. Okay. In fact, uh, let me just show you this right in um, R for a moment, and I'll show you a couple shortcuts and uh, Control L. All right. So first, I'm going to give myself enough space for this plot to show up in the bottom right-hand corner in my plot window. I'm going to press enter on the code on the left and there's my plot. Now you notice that there's some nice defaults in here. The background range of the data is a gray box. Furthermore, let me go back to the notes. It's a little easier to see here. Furthermore, there's a grid. There's major and minor grid axes. Okay, So there's a major axes which are bold or sort of wide white lines at every tens, so the 40 and 30 of those wide, and then 35, there's a thin line. So we have minor and major grid axes, and you can control, you can control all these things. You can control, oh, my apologies, you can control the, the, the grid spacing, you can control uh, how many lines are drawn, all that stuff, okay? The defaults tend to be really darn good. So, but anyway, here's our, here's our black points. Uh, and here it is within R. Now I, I'm going to show you how to do this all in one line. Okay. And if I can, it is a little bit tricky working in the console with the arrow keys because R wants to interpret some things differently. So you can do something like this. All right. So I've taken my initialization of the axes and then I've added the points to it and all that in one line will work out just fine I'll press enter and you don't need the word print you can just do P and press enter and of course we didn't see anything because it wrote it on top but let me delete that plot and uh, press P that is my new plot it's exactly the same okay so you can do it all in one line um, I just prefer the syntax of or the, the pattern of, of doing adding one layer to the plot at a time. Set up the axes, add the points, print it. For me, that what that means is I can comment if I have a whole bunch of lines, which we'll see in a moment, I can comment one line and not affect the rest of the plot. So it, it gives me all the flexibility that I want. Alright, let's keep going. So we've got uh, geomes, sort of mentioned that already, that's sort of the type of thing that you're going to plot. We have aesthetics, which is our encodings. And those encodings, we've seen positions along the axes, but you also can encode to shape, colors, sizes of things. Um, and alpha is opacity, or the inverse of transparency. So if you, if you decrease alpha, you make something transparent. You can see through it. The default of alpha is 1, meaning it's opaque. And then faceting is one of my favorite things. It's small multiples, uh, we'll see that in a moment, where you can display different subsets of the data all together for the purpose of making nice comparisons. All right, lots of help is available. If you type into uh, Google or Bing, uh, R space ggplot space your question, uh, someone has probably answered it. All right, so let's assign another aesthetic. So within our geome point, okay, so this is exactly the same code. The only addition is what is inside the parentheses for the geome point. And we're creating another encoding. We're going to assign class, the class of the vehicle, to a color. So let's take a look at the output of that. We now have a legend on the right-hand side, which is class. It has the seven classes from two-seaters down to SUVs, and it takes a range of colors which are equally spaced in hue space. So HSV, hue saturation value, that is a three-dimensional uh, space where you can define colors. There is a one-to-one -one mapping between that and RGB, which is red, green, and blue. And th these space, these colors are equally spaced in hue space. 
which means that they're maxim maximally differentiable, provided you, you don't have color blindness. <laughs> so what, what do we see in this plot now that we've done it? Well, we've got a bunch of pink points down here at the bottom. Those are SUVs. Uh, we also have uh, dark blue points down here. Those are pickup trucks. So those are cars that have big engines and lousy highway miles per gallon. Okay. How about these points up in the top left? We've got a purple dot here. These are subcompacts. And we've got some uh, sort of mustard brown colors. Those are compact cars. The greens are midsize. So you're smaller cars. All right. What about these red dots here? Those have huge engines and miles per gallon that aren't that bad, but it's way better than these trucks and SUVs. Those red ones are two-seaters. So those are your mid-crisis mid -life crisis, uh, roadsters. Um, those are also probably going to be four-wheel or uh, rear-wheel drives. And, you know, all right. So I encourage you to experiment with this. So if you want to pause the video right now and uh, just look at this one line, and assign different variables to color or assign different variables to uh, up here we've also got shape and size and alpha um, give it a try see what you get uh, the best way to learn about how this stuff works is to experiment and play uh, the, and the second way the second best way is to continue watching this video here we go so experiment um, some of the things that you'll you'll see, for example, if you've got um, color and you map a discrete variable to it, you'll get a rainbow of colors just like we, we saw. If you map a continuous variable, like miles per gallon, then you'll get a gradient starting at red and going up to blue, okay, sort of low value up to high value. And you can change what the, the low and high values of this gradient are and how it's mapped and lots of flexibility. Uh, same thing with size. You've got uh, discrete steps versus some uh, mapping of the radius. Now notice if you have a circular dot and you map radius and you look at the area, of course the area is the squ a squared relationship to the radius. So you have to be careful of distortions with size. Um, and then shapes, of course, um, if you try a continuous range of shapes, that shouldn't work. But if you have a discrete number of shapes, that will work. But keep in mind that's only going to work for your human mind up to about four or five different shapes. Beyond that, they're all going to start uh, getting confounded. All right, so let's uh, just create, um, just try something out. So I'm going to assign those geometric points. I'm going to assign the class of the variable to color, the number of symbols, the <laughs> cylinders to size, and then the drive four-wheel, front-wheel, rear-wheel drive to the shape and print that plot. And here we go. We have a legend that has three different uh, dimensions. By the way, speaking of dimensions, how many dimensions of data have we just plotted? We have displacement is one, highway is two, drive type is three, cylinder type to size is four, class is color. That's five dimensions on one plot. I hope you're impressed. <laughs> All right, so check it out. Cylinder was mapped to size. That was a purposeful choice because um, number of cylinders sort of de de defines the size of your engine. Look at all the large engines down here, okay? And all the and large engines in our two-seater roadsters. All of our two-seater roadsters are squares. That shape is the rear-wheel drive cars. That's up here. We also have some circles. Those are four-wheel drives. Okay, so four-wheel drive, purple SUVs um, with eight cylinders. That's what these big circles are. We've got some s large squares, too. Those are rear-wheel drives. Uh, Front-wheel drives are triangles. Where are those? Okay, we start to get tri large triangles. Or medium triangles are our six-cylinder um, front-wheel drives. And then all of our four-cylinder front wheel drives with these triangles up in the upper left hand corner. So we're, we're starting to understand the story of what, uh, what our data look like through visualization. Visualization is communication. All right, let me do one more thing. Um, 
I'm, I've added this alpha argument. So alpha is the opacity. That's uh, basically how much um, how much light is blocked by the object. Um, and I've set this to one quarter. What that means is that four points, you can see that these sort of faint points, this is not the plot I would produce for a publication, but what this means is that four points can be laid on top of each other and you can still see all four before the fifth one is hidden underneath. Um, all right, so what we see is, uh, for example, right down here, let me zoom in here. We got a circle and a square that lays on top of each other. Um, here, I think we've got two, maybe two squares because it's sort of a dark pink, and then one circular, one blue circle. So you can start to see because of um, the transparency that, that that multiple points are laying on top of each other. Look at these two circles. There's one circle on the left, and then two circles in exactly the same place on the right, and they can lay on exactly on top of each other because. Um, that just have the same value in the data set. Um, these data are rounded to the nearest mile per gallon, so it's not necessarily a surprise. All right, whoops, zooming out. All right, faceting, what Edward Tufte calls small multiples, um, also has several other names, such as uh, a trellis chart or a lattice chart, a grid chart, panel chart, blah, blah, blah. So the two, the three, maybe the three main names are small multiples. That's the name that's most common in the literature. Faceting, which is the word that's used in the grammar graphics, and then lattice, which is the word used in the lattice package. So I'm going to show you the examples of this, and then we'll go back and look at the code. So let's start with just the upper left-hand corner. So this plot has engine displacement along the horizontal axis, and those numbers are repeated. Um, the displacement here has four categories up at the top. Uh, four, five, six, and eight. Mm, nope. Displacement are these numbers down here, two through seven. Uh, what's being faceted is the number of cylinders. Okay, four cylinder cars, five cylinder cars, six cylinder, and eight cylinders. Along the vertical axis, we have highway miles per gallon. And so what we see is that for the box on the left, and there isn't a good way for me to draw that, I guess something like this. Uh, this box here is for all the four-cylinder cars, and then we have this box here, which is for all the five-cylinder cars. And each of those boxes have the same displacement horizontal axis and highway vertical axis. So once you understand one of the plot regions, you understand all of them, which makes it possible to make very quick comparisons. There's a slightly smaller or slightly slightly larger spacing between the facets um, and so to try to separate the plot regions without it being uh, too overt about what where the uh, frames begin and end but what we see is that there's two cars that are five cylinder cars at, at least two cars maybe a couple of these dots lay on top of each other um, but we see the four cylinder cars are largely reg relegated to the small displacements and the eight cylinder cars have big displacements and low highway gallons. So small multiples are great for forcing the eye to make comparison. All right, so let me scroll up back to the code that produced that plot. So we're starting with our very basic plot. Okay, we've mapped displacement to X highway miles to y, and plotted points. And that object is stored in p. And we haven't printed it. We're going to um, add to the p a facet. And so that first plot that we saw 
is going to be faceted as a grid. We're not going to separate the rows, but by column we will separate by cylinder, by the number of cylinders. Okay, and we're going to assign that to P1, and we're gonna we're gonna end up printing P1 down here along with the other P's. The second plot is going to um, facet on drive type by row and we're going to put a period as a placeholder that we're not separating by column and that is going to, into P2. The third one we're going to separate by both drive type and number of cylinders, rows and columns. And then the fourth one we're actually doing a different function here. We're doing facet wrap and this is handy when you have a category that has many well, a categorical variable that has many categories. So class has a number of categories, and it's just going to wrap it around. All right, so we'll see it in a second. So grid extra is a package that allows us to print um, many uh, graphical objects. So we've created four graphical objects here, and we're going to arrange them into two columns, printing from left to right. So if we go down here, uh, this top left plot is P1. We've set, uh, plotted them by fa we faceted them by column by the number of cylinders. The second one we have faceted by rows by the drive type, four wheel drive, front wheel drive, and rear wheel drive. Plot three, we did it by both. So we've got column uh, facets by number of cylinders and row facets by drive type. And so, for example, we can see here that all of the five cylinder cars, all the five cylinder cars are front wheel drive. Uh, for rear wheel drive, six cylinder cars, there aren't that many. How about rear wheel drive, eight cylinder cars? Yeah, lots of those right here. There's only one, perhaps, front wheel drive, eight cylinder car. And then we have lots of four wheel drive, eight cylinder cars. Uh, finally, the one in the bottom right is the facet wrap. So the, cl the class of the, ver of the vehicle, we had two-seater, compact, midsize, and so on. And so it just wraps from left to right and then goes to the next row. Lots of SUVs in our data set. Just a handful of minivans, just a couple two-seaters. All right, let's talk about how to improve plots. Um, often you'll start off by producing a single plot and then you can ask yourself, does this tell the story of the data or does this reveal all the features of the data that I think are important? Um, another way to say that is, do I fully understand the data by looking at this visualization? Okay, so here is, um, I'm just going to plot city miles per gallon as the x variable and highway miles per gallon as the y variable and plot the points. And I'll scroll down and look at that. There we are. And all right. A little hard to manipulate this plot here. Okay, here we go. So do you remember how many data points we had in this data set? 234. How many points do you see? If you said less than that, you are correct. And why would there be less than that? Well, look at the regular lattice that these points lay on. There's just a grid. And what's that grid? It's actually, it's a little confusing. It looks like it's every two miles per gallon. So, oh no, it's uh, every single mile per gallon. So this is 10, this is 15. So we have 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. Okay, so these are mile per gallon increments. So they never rated a car as being, you know, 15 and a half miles per gallon. They just rounded it to 15 or 16. So what does that mean? There's a bunch of points that are laying on top of each other. So we've not shown all the data. And for any single dot that we see, it's impossible to tell how many points are actually there. So one solution 
is to jitter the points and so um, and to reduce the opacity so here is an example where in addition to the geom point I've added two arguments in there the first one is for the position I'm going to jitter the points and what that means is it it's going to uh, displace the points slightly so for example let's scroll up for a second uh, let's look at the focus on this point in the bottom left hand corner okay it looks like it's got nine city miles per gallon and maybe 13 maybe 13 maybe 12 um, highway miles per gallon okay but that that single dot has many points on it oh yeah I can use that okay so it's this point right here so if we jitter that we now see that little cluster and we see now that there were actually five points there so the jitter has displaced them and then we made alpha equals let's scroll up and look maybe by zooming out <laughs> alpha equals one half so the points are somewhat transparent and as they lay on top of each other they get darker zooming out okay I'll try not to do too many screen mani manipulations like that I know it's uh, not easy to follow alright so here's an another plot that can be improved we are plotting the class of the of the vehicle on the x-axis and the highway miles per gallon on the y-axis and just plotting those points okay zoom in a little bit there we go. So we've got our two-seaters, our compacts, our mid-size. And as you look across the categories, um, you know, you have a sense of what the what the center of the distribution is and, and what the range of the distribution is. Uh, from the previous plot, we know that a lot of these points lay on top of each other. So what would you like to do? There's there's at least there's at least two or three changes I would make to this plot. Um, so one one obvious thing is to jitter the points and which way would you like to jitter them so we probably just want to jitter them horizontally so that uh, because midsize for example is a class if you jitter them left to right that doesn't change that they belong to the midsize class right as long as they stayed near near the center line if you jitter them up and down then you distort the highway miles per gallon just a little bit it's probably not a big deal but might as well only distort what you need to in order to see the plot. Uh, what else What else about this cl these classes? So they're ordered two-seater, compact, mid -size. They're ordered alphabetically. Maybe you want to order them um, by some, something else. For example, pickup seems to have the lowest highway miles per gallon. Maybe you want that to be the lowest one. And then the subcompacts perhaps our midsize or compact one of those three are going to be the highest so maybe you want sort of an increasing trend so we can order those categories if we want alright so the first thing that we do here is order them um, by the mean of their values this I find much nicer so that I look at the left I see pickups and SUVs don't get good highway miles on the right, we got subcompacts and compacts. They, they get better miles per gallon and also a wider range of miles per gallon. And we did that by mapping the to the x variable, so the horizontal axis. We're mapping the classes, but we're reordering the classes based on their highway miles. And the default reordering is based on the mean. So for each class, for example, for the class pickup, we calculated the mean, which is maybe around 18 or so. And, um, and then for SUV, we calculated that mean, maybe that's about 20. 
and then we rank ordered them based on the means. So we had pickup was the less, the least, SUV the second, and so on. Really handy function for this sort of plotting. Okay, and then of course here is uh, what happens if you jitter the points. So we have that nice increase, but you know what? I'm not crazy about this jittering. This jitter is a bit too extreme. Okay, so how would, how did that jitter happen? In the geom point, we asked for position jitter. Uh, and this position jitter actually jitters up and down as well as left and right. So, but it, there is there is not enough space, in my opinion, between the two categories to very, really clearly differentiate pickups and SUVs visually. Right? There's a small margin up this corridor, but it's not quite big enough. So. I'm going to recommend a little less jitter. And that actually brings us to a slightly different function. This is a function called geom jitter, which is really geom points, but with a little more control of what's, how it's being jittered. And so within geom jitter, we specify the position equals, we're going to position, we're going to jitter the position. And here we get to specify what type of jitter and how much. So width means we're going to specify, we're going to jitter them left and right. Oh, you know what? I disagree with myself <laughs> uh, based on what I'm seeing down here. So the width of the jitter is in all directions, and that's going to be 0.1. Now, if you do 0.5, that means that the, the width, it's going to be half the width on either side. So... Uh, 0.5 is really the maximum you'd want. You'd start to overlap with your neighbors beyond that. So 0.1 is really about 20% of the width. But I think I think that's a nice looking plot now. We got the jitter so that the points are not laying on top of each other, but they are clearly they clearly belong to uh, only one category. Okay. Now points aren't the only geometric object we can plot. There's uh, dozens of these. Here we're going to not put down plot, uh, points, but we're going to put down a box plot. And you'll recall that a box plot plots the five number summary of a distribution in addition to um, points, which are uh, deemed as outliers because they are some distance away uh, from the main box um, of the distribution. So we've got uh, the box plot, which indicate the quarters of the data and uh, any extreme observations. And here's our first opportunity to see layering. So we have here, we've assigned the x and the y axes. We've laid down a layer of points with geom jitter and then we've laid down a box plot on top of it okay and notice that with the box plot we've specified alpha equals 0.5 so if we zoom in on how about some of these boxes over here the alpha equals 0.5 of the box plot means that the white box of the box plot is transparent and so we can see the white we can see the black points through the white box, which is why they're a lighter color gray. So how would you improve this plot? I mean, this is pretty good. We see all the points, and we see the five-number summary. This is a great plot, but it can be made even better just by swapping the order of whether we put the box plot on top of the points or the points on top of the box plot. So in this plot, I have first put the layer with the box plot, and then on top of that, put down the points. So if we look at that plot, look at the same point. Now the points don't change their salience. They're all on top of the box plot. And if you look real closely, you can see the grid lines through the box plot because we've made the box plot um, half transparent. 
Okay, zooming out. All right, this next plot uh, reorders based on a different variable. Otherwise, it's exactly the same plot. This reorder, the default function for reorder is the mean. But here I want to specify that these classes are sorted by the median. So notice here we've got pickup, SUV, minivan. This is really small to see. But these last three classes are midsize, subcompact, and compact. And if we look at the, the box plots, you know, the median is the center line in the boxes. The mean for this subcompact group is, is somewhat higher because some of these extreme values up top. Uh, but the median is less than the, the subcompact. In fact, that's, that's fine. It's really these two, the midsize, the third from the right, and the second from the right. Those two, if we sort it by median, let me go to the next plot. All right, we have subcompact on the left and compact on the right. Now they're all sorted by the median center line of the boxes using fun equals median. All right, that is everything for uh, getting started with ggplot. The main ideas here are that you take a data frame, map variables in the data frame to um, you encode them in different ways either as position along the axes or as symbols or colors or shapes and I guess shapes and symbols are the same thing and then uh, and you maybe produce some small multiples if you want to make comparisons by categories and just with a few commands you have uh, tons of power to visualize things in a, a very uh, sophisticated way. The last thing I'll say as part of these notes is um, a, as a course overview, if you take a look at the second chapter um, or second uh, semester of this course and look at chapter one, that will give you a brief overview view of almost all the statistical methods that we're going to see during this semester. So that's been uh, visual Visualization with the Grammar Graphics, ggplot as implemented by Hadley Wickham in the ggplot2 package for R.